uh, Roger's uh, bio is particularly long, <clears throat> so forgive me, Roger. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll do just uh, what I can remember. Uh, Roger Molina is a space scientist and astronomer. He teaches art and technology at the University of Texas at Dallas. Uh, he's the founder of the Art Science Art Sci Lab at uh, UT Dallas. Uh, he's also the director of research at the CNR's National Center of Scientific Research in France, and uh, previously served as director of an astronomic uh, observatory in France. <clears throat> he has participated in several NASA projects. Uh, he has received a number of uh, awards and honors, and uh, for a number of years, he was the chairman, the chairman of Leonardo Isas, the International Society for the Arts, Science, and Technology. Okay, so I invited Roger to speak <clears throat> about somebody that we lost recently at the age of 102. Um, so he uh, lived one century and he was very influential uh, in many ways. I'll let, I'll let Roger do the introduction of this um, influential scholar. Okay, good evening, uh, good day, good night, wherever you are. Um, as Piero said, um, I actually knew uh, Frank Popper um, when I think I first met him when I was six years old and he was arguing with my father. Uh, and when you're six and someone argues with your father, you get very interested. <laughs> um, so uh, I'm right now, I'm in bed in Dallas, Texas, uh, in my pajamas. And I'm very pleased to be invited by Tammy and Piero to speak this evening. I was in email contact with Frank Popper until he was 100 years old. And at the same time, I was working with 16-year-olds here uh, who were interning in our earth science lab in Dallas. So what a different world we live in, where the 100-year-olds can talk to the 16-year-olds using virtual reality. So I'm gonna verbalize a testimonial. This is not an obituary, it's not an academic paper. Um, when I sat down yesterday to try and write down my ideas, um, I remembered a number of key things uh, that come to this. So as I said, um, I met uh, Popper when I was six or seven. At that time, uh, my father, Frank Molina, had become a political refugee in France because the US government and the FBI threatened to imprison him because some of his friends were communists. And at the time, the city of Paris uh, government was full of communists uh, and the FBI spies went around the art galleries to see if the artists were selling secrets to the enemy. Since my father could no longer get a job, he became a full-time artist. As a result, I had a very confused childhood. I knew my father was a scientist and engineer, but when I came home from school, my father was painting. That's what I thought scientists and engineers did. I don't know exactly when my father first met Frank Popper. Popper was born in Prague in the Czech Republic in 1918. He escaped the Nazi Holocaust and Frank Popper eventually li lived in England and Paris, taught at the Sorbonne and became really a very important figure in our cultural milieu. My father on the other hand was born in Texas in 1912, but his parents moved to Prague around 1918, right after World War I, a couple of years after Frank Popper was born. I don't think they met in Prague in the 1920s, but they were certainly uh, very close uh, in the same environment. And they were both in the Czech Republic when the word robot was invented in the 1920s. Robot in, comes from the Czech word robota, which means forced labor. The the term was coined by a theater writer called Kapchak. The play was called R.U.R. Rossum's Universal Robots. And already at the time, 
ethical issues arising from forced labor, now called artificial intelligence, were much discussed in the art world. Today, artists collaborate with AI robots to make art. Frank Popper would have been fascinated by this development a hundred years later in the 21st century. It all began robots in the Czech Republic. So yes, Frank Popper and my father and my Czech grandmother would speak in Czech so the kids could not understand what they were arguing about. And yes, they argued a lot in our living room in boulogne billancourt which at the time was a poor suburb of Paris where my father had built a painting studio. Sometimes on Thursday nights, a group of friends, including Popper, would come to our home and play chess and all the while arguing about art and technology and politics. My brother and I, who were just kids at the time, would hide on the balcony in the living room, listening to them argue. And so I have no doubt some of my ideas came from Frank Popper arguing with artists and intellectuals. My father at the time, who was a trained engineer, as I said, was taking painting lessons from a New Zealand artist called Vic Gray, who was also part of this, these chess nights. One time my father came back from oil painting class and he threw his paint brushes on the floor and exclaimed, I'm tired of painting dead fish. Ha! Huh. Frank Popper said, why? And my dad said, I want to paint the world we as scientists see and know through microscopes and telescopes. It took the impressionists to take their paintbrushes into the countryside. Let's take our paintbrushes into the microscopes and telescopes. Frank Popper had this passion about art, its theories, its history, and went on to become, yes, a historian of art and technology before it became a movement. First pop art and op art and kinetic art, he then went on to be convinced that interactive art and other technologies such as virtual reality, holography, and so on, he talked about immersive virtual reality where maybe all the senses could be touched by the artist. After all, my father and Popper agree on one thing, the purpose of an artist was to create experiences for humans, use any technologies at their disposal. And sometimes those experiences would change human minds. Much later, Umberto Eco talked about how these immersive realities could be thought of as the use of the computer as a spiritual tool. My father was a devout atheist, so I don't think virtual reality as a spiritual tool would have tempted him. I don't remember my father and papa arguing about religion, but they did argue about a lot of other things. Back in the 1950s, when my father couldn't get a job, he started making paintings, assemblage from bric-a-brac and bits of material around the studio. We now call that all kinds of other words. You can make art using anything ar lying around your studio. He discovered the moiré effect, when multiple layers of wire grids together and you walk past them and the images seem to change and move as you walk past. Even if you stand still in front of the painting and just shift your head a bit, somehow there is movement in the painting. This was obviously the birth of op art. How can you play with human perception and fool it by simple geometric patterns? Surprising. Why didn't the Greeks invent that? They invented geometry. Later, Frank Popper became one of the champions of the op artists. But I'm getting ahead of my narrative. In the mid 50s, my father tried to put light bulbs inside his moiré paintings so he could accentuate the contrast in the picture. We were sitting at the dinner table and the moiré painting with the light bulb started making smoke and burst into flames. Ha, my dad said. Now he knows 
why light bulbs were not a good artistic tool. But then the next Christmas, the ugly Americans introduced the Christmas tree light bulb garland on Christmas trees. And we had one. We were one of the first kids in the neighborhood that had Christmas tree blinking lights. One night, my dinner, my dad at dinner, he said, look, the tree isn't burning. The tree isn't burning. I can make electric art. He ran and took the Christmas tree lights down to my brother and my dismay. We didn't have a Christmas tree anymore. He put the garland of Christmas tree lights blinking in his, his painting, and it was there for weeks without burning. And Frank Popper saw it. My father went on to show his first electro paintings in, in Paris. I forget the exact gallery, Colette Allende or Guten, uh, the um, Gutenberg Gallery, I forget what it's called. He went on to put motors and other electronics in, in his paintings to make them move and change. I mentioned these moments in my childhood because Frank Popper, who at the time uh, was younger than my father, but no older than us, was part of this group of artists and thinkers he, who went on to call, create a movement called kinetic art, which followed with a number of other art movements that integrated contemporary technologies into art making. Yes, Frank Popper was a historian. He was rigorous. He wrote a lot of books. But he also was an advocate of living artists. He spent times with them creating new kinds of art forms. And I think he influenced a lot of artists in their art making. At the time, the galleries and museum curators said, if you have to plug in the painting in the wall, it's not art. Get out of my gallery. Go and show it somewhere else. You can't have artwork that you have to plug in. Popper disagreed, too. He organized art exhibitions in Paris, museums and galleries, showing the work of these kinetic artists. He helped artists connect with buyers through galleries such as the Denise René Gallery. He wrote books advocating of the work of these artists. We would call them hackers and makers today. No art school on the planet taught art of this kind. Frank Popper wrote the books that the art schools later started to use. He was a multidisciplinary, multidisciplinary worker, aesthetician, historian, cultural theorist, curator, teacher of the Sorbonne, and art critic. He, book, he wrote books that influenced hundreds and thousands of people. In, these books include Art, Action, and Participation, Art of the Electronic Age, and From Technological to Virtual Art. But then my dad and Papa got into huge arguments. I think I have about five minutes left, Kiro, is that all right? Okay, my, so I'll try and summarize uh, my last page. One of the arguments- uh, Roger, before you go on, uh, you wanted to ask the audience if anybody met Popper, um, <clears throat> please uh, post uh, on, uh, on the chat. Uh, and uh, if you didn't meet him in person, but you knew, something about him, post it on chat. Thank you, uh, Piero. So what did Popper and my father argue about? Eventually they argued so much, so much they stopped being friends. My father objected to the fact that artists weren't allowed to write about their own art. Only people like Frank Popper, who was a critic, was allowed to write art about art. And this upset my father. The writing of estheticians such as Popper, my father felt was useless and of no value to working artists. It was just a bunch of aesthetics ideas. Artists couldn't use it in their art making. And worst of all, my father argued with Popper because the commercial galleries that Popper circulated in exploited the artists as indentured servants. It was the galleries that made the profit and the artists barely made a living wage. My father refused to sign a contract with the Denise Relay Gallery that Popper had recommended. So my father and a group of friends started the Leonardo Journal that's now 53 years old. The founding editors included Buckminster Fuller, Georgie Kepesh, Rudolf Arnheim, Max Bill. 
But when my father died in 81, the publisher said, let's close the journal down. It was your father's pet project. We don't need it anymore. So I went on a pilgrimage, and one of the people I met with was Frank Popper. And Frank, even though he and my father had argued to the death and stopped being friends, said, look, let's try and keep it going. And Frank Popper was on the Leonardo editorial board until he died this year. So for me, this is a little bit of an emotional testimony. Every time I was in Paris, I would meet Frank Popper for tea at one of those Louvre area cafeterias and we would discuss the contemporary art movements, the connections with all the new technologies that were emerging. He was a professional in what I call intellectual dated, dating. He made connections between activities that nobody else saw. He crossed disciplinary boundaries with abandon. Today, I'm working with a young artist. Her name is Ariel Kumstock. She's working on a virtual reality artwork that Popper would have enjoyed. You wear a VR helmet, you walk to the grave of your parents, and your parents appear visually, and you can engage in them in arguments. When Frank Popper recently died, I could not come to the funeral or the cemetery meeting in Père Lachaise. Oh, if only Frank Popper had met Ariel Kunstock before he died, he could visit his grave and argue with him in virtual reality. Thank you, Frank Popper, for your friendship to me and our family, your moral support that championed the work of technological artists for so long, in your case, from the 1950s to 1920s. 70 years of championship of risk-taking artists. And the Leonardo Journal continues today, thanks in part to your help and moral support. Thank you. And I will uh, stop in a slightly emotional state. Thank you. OK, Roger, now I'm going to do something <clears throat> um, to cheer you up. So I changed your name. Can you see oh. I changed your name? OK, now we have Frank Popper. And I'm going to ask you some questions. So I want you to guess how he would have answered these questions. Is that okay? Um, well, except I know in the audience there are some other people who've met Frank Popper. So if I give the wrong answer, maybe you could contradict me in the chat. Okay. So, yeah. Tonight I'm Frank Popper. I'm going to turn off the camera so you don't know that I'm not really Frank Popper. That's okay. Go ahead. Ready? Okay. So, first question, and uh, this is also to complete uh, uh, his biography in a sense. <clears throat> in 1968, you wrote a book, Origins and Development of Kinetic Art, uh, where you spoke about the role of movement in art. In 1975, you wrote Art, Action, and Participation, where you spoke about spectator participation. In, a, in 1980s, I don't know exactly which year, uh, you started talking about virtual reality, which, correct me if I'm wrong, today we call it immersive art. And in 1997, you wrote about a book, uh, Art of the Electronic Age. So, movement in art, spectator participation, immersive art, electronic age. You see this as different stages? Do they build one on top of the other? Do they intersect? Okay, so I guess where I disagree with you is, you know, what are artists trying to do? They're creating experiences that change people's minds. Well, we know how to do that in all kinds of art forms, and they involve what is now called embodied cognition. If you can interact with the artwork, it gives you excitement or maybe huh, why did the artwork not like me? And so I felt that interactive art, immersive art, was just a logical continuation of what artists have done forever since they painted cave paintings. And as Rudolf Hahnheim pointed out, 
the fire in the cave would flicker and the paintings on the wall in the cave would seem to move. That was up art 20,000 years ago. The fire in the cave would flicker, and the paintings on the cave, the legs of the animals would seem to walk. So that's my answer. I think you're biased by the way the commercial art world slows down the work of artists trying to find new ways to create experiences for human beings. Um, you lived the, through the tragedies of the 20th century <clears throat> uh, that used technology to kill in a massive, unprecedented ways. Uh, the airplane in World War I, uh, the gas chamber and the atomic bomb in World War II, uh, the chemical weapons, I guess, throughout the century. Uh, so was that an influence on your study of uh, technology and art? Well, to be honest, you're bringing up very unpleasant memories for me. Uh, you know, I was born in the Czech Republic. I, I don't know, I forget what it was called at the time. Uh, it was in Prague, which is still called Prague, but the various European powers kept taking over Central Europe and they killed people with any weapon at their disposal. And obviously in the Jewish Holocaust, uh, we reached one of the extremes uh, of genocide, although um, no, only in the last few years, I've been upset by other genocides that are going on in the world. And so I guess as an escapee from World War II, I was welcomed by English and French people. I was allowed to create a career of my own. And somehow I felt at peace with myself that arts, artists would know how to use the tools of war for peaceful purposes and to create human experiences. So yes, today, soldiers in America use teleweapons, or kind of drones and things. They kill people using virtual reality to kill people in Iran. Huh, why can't artists make virtual reality that makes human beings well by creating experiences for them. So I guess I am a piece of myself that technology itself is not the problem, it's what people do with it. And artists do amazing things with the same tools that bad people use to kill people. You, you leave the you lived in England during World War II. Uh, then you studied in Italy. Then you ended up in uh, uh, Paris. So you were an immigrant, an exile, a refugee for your life. Um, how that influenced um, your well, You know, the amazing thing in England is who did I run into? It was the people who ran the Bauhaus and had been expelled from Germany by Hitler. And so ironically, it was the migrants that built the future, not the settlers. The, the settlers were just killing each other. It was the intellectual migrants who kept hope alive. And so yes, I had to keep moving from England to Italy to France. Finally, I got a job at the Sorbonne. But boy, was that a difficult journey. So. Yes, isn't it strange how in the 20th century, one of the side effects of a war was a cultural revolution, not a Chinese one. And maybe since I'm dying right now, just at the time of the COVID-19 pandemic, maybe there will be a different kind of artistic explosion after the pandemic. So I guess I came away from my life horror stories with an optimism that artists can help make the world better. Um, <clears throat> some questions about technology. You moved uh, to Paris at about the same time that, um, uh, I don't remember his first name, Pierre, Pierre Schaffer 
uh, invented Musique Concrète. Uh, so using electronic... Uh, okay, so that's very interesting. I first met Pierre Schaeffer at, um, the living, in the living room at Frank, Man Frank Molina when we were playing chess. Huh. And so yeah. that living room was, was sort of a, a bouillabaisse of visual artists, musical artists, artists from different uh, areas that were all excited. Zanakis, of course, uh, Takis. Uh, they, were, you know, they were part of a, you know, and it's, you know, I don't know how we do this in the virtual age now the, um, that's emerging. You know, what is the equivalent of a salon <laughs> when you're online and you really, it's very difficult to argue intelligently online. So yes, Pierre Schaffer uh, and his work at ORTF, um, Zanakis obviously, the birth of Urcam that came out of nowhere with Boulez. So yes, I was part of this bouillabaisse of people that were, I guess, not techno-optimists because they were basically techno-skeptics, but they want to make sense of the world with any tools at their disposal. Hmm. And yes, um, I would meet them in galleries. Uh, we would circulate. Some of them I met in Frank Molina's living room. So yes, um, it's hard to explain how a very small group of people, and at the beginning it was no, maybe no more than a hundred, would somehow figure out to attend the same parties, go to the same gallery openings, uh, long before I became a professor at the Sorbonne. And so hopefully in the post-pandemic world, we will figure out, you will figure out, not me since I'm dead now, um, you will figure out how to create collective empathy, which is one of the things that happens in gallery openings and other places. Um, <clears throat> interesting. Uh, so there's, there's uh... Oh, oh yeah. someone just asked me if I met Norbert Wiener. Oh, well, that you was, know, I am that was my next question. I am 103, so I, 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 of course, know very well the work of Norbert Wiener, and I cited him in, in several of my books. Um, you know, obviously, cybernetics is part of this whole... I can't remember, uh, Craig, uh, did, if I met Norbert Wiener. Did you? Craig, did you meet... Norbert Wiener, oh. Did anybody listening meet Norbert Wiener? I forget when he died, but he certainly left a legacy. Um, <clears throat> to, to, so so you, you, you published the book on the kinetic art in 1968. Two people were very influential at the time. Uh, just tell me if they had any connection with uh, the development of your uh, thoughts. One is uh, Michel Foucault. He published The History of Madness in 61. And the other one is McLuhan, who came up with The, the Medium as the Message in 1964. I don't remember the title of the book where he says this. So the answer is yes. Uh, I did meet both of them individually. Um, but indeed, um, this whole discussion uh, that McLuhan uh, really infected us with about The Medium as the Message, uh, we need to understand how the media we use affect what we can say with it, what experiences we can create. The technology is not neutral. Uh, and that's the same, you know, that was part of uh, McLuhan's thing, is the technology biases what you can express. And uh, so, yes, I think McLuhan's ideas were ones that I really uh, shared. shared. Um, the other person you mentioned was? Michel Foucault. So yes, he was clearly part of the uh, left bank uh, community in Paris. I didn't know him very well. Um, <clears throat> okay, coming to modern world, uh, what do you think of the word post-human? Uh, Catherine Hales, uh, how be we became post-human and what's his name? Uh, the guy who wrote the post-human condition, both published uh, around the year 2000. Okay, so I, I, I don't really latch on to Catherine's terminology. Um, I think the, you know, I guess the way I feel is we're trying to reinvent the human. And 
the new art forms are one way of doing that. Um, and yes, um, we could modify the human body. Uh, Stellark has done a lot of work and I enjoyed visiting his gallery shows and so on. But no, I'm not very sympathetic to the, the, the idea of the post-human. I think we need to reinvent the human. Very good. Good job, Roger. Thank you, Piero. <clears throat> Thank you, audience. Um, oh, Mona, do I believe if automated methods such as deep learning could predict the visual complexity of artworks? Okay, well, um, I've not had, I didn't have time to write much about this, but I think uh, we are living in a very exciting time when artificial life is becoming an intelligent enough that it's like artificial kids, you know, maybe a year old. And as Aaron Cohen and a lot of other people started saying, when he worked with computers and AI, it became a collaboration. The computer had ideas, the human had ideas. And there's another French scholar who really uh, emphasized that, I just forget his name. So, um, so yes. Um, now, whether you could predict the visual complexity of artworks, I think what's interesting is that artificial life and a life, which of course uh, there have been many festivals of, um, can create artworks that human beings by themselves could not imagine. So I think predict, I'm not sure about predict, but I think the coupling of human and artificial imagination could be part of helping human beings reinvent themselves in the world we're now entering, um, which uh, a friend of mine, uh, Roger Molina, calls where the digital natives are creating a digi indigenous world. And we old people are the ugly tourists trying to learn the customs and rituals of the digi indigenous world that the digital natives have to create. So not post-human, maybe we go back to the digi-indigenous world where we respect plants, trees, oceans, and each other. Thank you, Piero, for your questions.